Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful day the Lord has made for us. And an awesome time that we're having at the summit. Looked at some of your comments on the app. And my name is Larry Ward. I'm the pastor of the Abundant Life Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Also the co-founder of the Boston Entrepreneurship Gathering. And I'm blessed to participate in the Faith and Work Summit for the last several years, beginning in Boston, then going to Dallas, and privileged to serve with the steering team for Faith and Work Chicago. Just as we're preparing this uh, session this morning, we certainly want to go before the Lord in prayer and ask for his presence. And I'd like to call to the podium Moy Mendez, who is a campus pastor of InterVarsity, MBA ministry programs in Booth School of Business and Kellogg School of Management, and he's going to come and give us the opening prayer. Moy. Well, I'd like to express what the faith and work movement means to me. In one word, it means hope. As a Latino, I'm very much aware of the struggles that has happened with my family and friends in the workplace. We've often bifurcated work and faith. And that's happened because coming to the United States, sometimes illegally, you know that you have to put a pretense of false documentation, which is a lie to begin with, receive money under the table where there's a lot of exploitation. So it's hard to reconcile the two. But knowing that faith and work, this movement, is enriching our understanding as pastors, as lay leaders, as businessmen, is reaching all the way to these different parts of this business culture that God is looking to redeem. So what it means for me is hope. It means hope as a campus pastor, going into Booth and Kellogg and helping top tier MBA students at Booth and Kellogg grapple with these concepts. I had one of the students last week say, one of the reasons for me coming to Booth is so that I could sit at the sea level and make sure that there's justice and equity all the way at the top to the bottom. As a made to flourish pastor, it means creating culture and community where people in the community are able to grow in their agency. So in one word, the faith and work movement for me means hope. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we're filled with hope, knowing that you're redeeming all things to yourself. And we thank you for the way that you're doing it. You're using a vehicle, the faith and work movement. And Lord, as this movement takes place, I pray that it would burn in all of our hearts. From the pastor to the lay leader to the businessman, that Lord, we could express your justice and truth in ways that's going to be part of this redeeming work so that all things could be redeemed to you. So Lord, today we thank you for what you're doing through this movement and how it's impacting every part of society. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sponsor for this portion of the summit also happens to be our host this year, hosting this year, and that is the Center for Transformational Churches at Trinity International University. What the center does, it develops Christian leaders, congregations and communities that empower uh, the gospel change through whole life discipleship and houses the Okinomiya Network, a seminary initiative with 21 partner schools and has been supporting the summit from the very beginning. We are so grateful for the Center for Transformational Churches. Thank you so much. Would you give them a round of applause? Well, I guess we're going to frame our session this morning, and uh, as we're coming to this, this climax of such a wonderful, wonderful couple of days, it is important that we continue to do the good work that glorifies God. And the Bible not only informs us uh, on how we need to be ethical and have standards for our work, and it's, the Bible also shows us what it means to have good work and what it's like. And there are many images and stories and models that we can learn from and apply to our work. It is not enough to know the Bible verses about how God cares about our work. He has provided so much more for us to draw upon. 
A wonderful gift that God has given to us is the gift of imagination. Having the ability to think in pictures is a blessing from God, and we use our imaginations from uh, all the time, and we, whether we are daydreaming, planning events, or solving problems that we come up against, and our imaginations gives us the ability to envision the future. Imagination, though, is fueled by input, and the input can come from the thoughts of others, it can come from books, movies, and even scripture. There's a story in the Bible in Genesis chapter 15 where Abraham talks to God about his fears. And he has three particular fears, but one particular one he has is he says to God, God, who is going to be the one who's going to inherit my estate? All I have is Eleazar from Dam of Damascus. I don't have a son. And the scripture tells us in verse 4 that the word of the Lord came to him. And this, it says that uh, this man will not be your heir but your son, who is of your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. And here's something powerful. The Bible says he takes him outside. He takes him outside and he says, look at the stars, because these stars are your offspring. And, and the Bible says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. This morning, the word of the Lord is going to come to us, and I want to encourage you to be open to take a look outside. Let this word inform you on how you need to think about your particular work in your context. God cares about your work, and he cares about it so much that he wants you to reimagine what the possibilities are. So as we start off th this morning, we want to bring uh, Dr. Cindy Richter, who's going to talk to us about what it means to reimagine our work. Dr. Richter is the Robert H. Gundry Chair of the Biblical Studies at Westmont College. She's the author of five books, including the Epic of Eden, as well as the numerous scholarly and, and popular works that bring the Old Testament to life and to help people understand how to be informed by it so we can live every day practicing our faith and work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandy Richter. Hey, so good morning. I am so privileged to be here. You are a new tribe for me, and I am eager to make our fictive kinship firm. Um, as introduced, I'm Sandy Richter. I'm a professor of Old Testament at Westmont College. We are the premier Christian liberal arts college on the West Coast, and all you APU and Seattle Pacific and Point Loma types, Ha ha, I've got the microphone. So, come our way, study with us, we are where you wanna be. So, my topic for this morning is of shepherds and sheep, to serve is to lead. All of us know about Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All of us know that Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, and most of us know that Philip Keller has written a killer devotional on sheep and shepherds. But do any of us know, really know, why this image frequents our biblical text and our faith lives? That's my job this morning, to rehabilitate a metaphor to bring an image to life and has been introduced to help us reimagine our work through the images and the um, embodiment that the biblical text has already given us. And oh, what a rich study we have ahead of us in our study of shepherd and sheeps. Sheeps. Well, one reason that sheep and shepherd have such a premier place in our biblical text is because pastoralism, that occupation of keeping mixed flocks of sheep and goats, was as old as the proverbial hills in the ancient Near East. Pastoralism was an essential building block to the international and domestic economies of Israel and their surrounding neighbors. And as a result, the concept of shepherd as leader was already ancient by the time Abraham the shepherd and Moses the shepherd and David the shepherd stepped on to the scene. Take George Adam Smith, for example. He was our earliest historical geography. Ge geographer. He actually traveled all over the land of Palestine with a notebook 
and riding on horseback with a sidekick, of course, that's always required, a canteen, over a hundred years ago. And in those days when such travel did not involve a 17-passenger air-conditioned minivan, sunblock, and visa cards, this is what George Adam Smith had to say about the shepherds that he met in Palestine. On some high moor, across which at night hyenas howl, when you meet him, sleepless, far-sighted, weather-beaten, armed, leaning on his staff and looking out over his scattered sheep, every one on his heart. You understand why the shepherd of Judea sprang to the front in his people's history, why they gave his name to their king and made him the symbol of providence, why Christ took him as the type of self-sacrifice. Even more interesting is that Smith was not actually the first person to make these observations. Here, you are looking at an image of Pharaoh's censurate from the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. That's 1200 BC. That's about the time our heroes start wandering into the land of Canaan. You're also looking at Naram Sin of Mesopotamia. That's 2200 BC, 200 years before the earliest possible dates of Abraham. Naram Sin is the tall, handsome guy up at the top of the stela. It is his stela, after all. All right, so what you see in the hand of Centurate is actually the staff of a shepherd. And you know well that Egyptians were not great fans of shepherds. Yet the image of shepherd as leader was so embedded in their worldview that this symbol of staff became the hieroglyph in Egyptian for leader. How about Naram Sin? He actually speaks of himself in the epic tale of the Curse of Agade as the shepherd Naram Sin. And Enlil, his uh, deified patron, one of the oldest gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon, speaks of himself as the shepherd of the black-headed people. So folks, the Israelites did not think up the idea of shepherd as leader or of sheep as followers. They adopted it. And why did they adopt it? Because everyone in their world knew what a shepherd did. Everyone in their world knew what a good shepherd looked like, and everyone in their world knew what a bad shepherd looked like. In the words of Lakoff and Johnson, these were the metaphors they lived by. Now, our issue as we approach this material is that we don't necessarily recognize their metaphors. We misinterpret their metaphors. We look at the concept of shepherd and we think of a lovely old Scottish fellow in a green meadow with a wool cap on and little black-faced sheep scampering about with a border collie at his heel. I'm going to change those images for you this morning. Um, one of the odder things you will come to learn about me is that one of my areas of expertise is actually Israelite animal husbandry. <laughs> Everyone has to have an expertise, and that one's mine. Anything you would like to know about gazelle or oprines or any of that sort of thing, ask me later. Okay, so I could tell you in more detail than you would ever want to know that in every era of Israelite history, our heroes are keeping sheep. From the days of nomadism in the wilderness, where sheep and goats were the primary source of food and textiles, to the days of agricultural settlement, when sheep and goats became one of several sources of their subsistence lifestyle, all the way to the monarchy, where our folks become suburbanites and every family has six to eight sheep and goats in their backyard to make sure they can take care of their own personal needs of milk and textile and meat. And this happens at every level of the socioeconomic scale as well. The royals are keeping tens of thousands of sheep under their hirelings on the royal fields. The entrepreneur has got his own flocks running. And then again, the average family, six to eight animals in the backyard. What sorts of flocks did they keep? Well, what you're looking at right now are images of show animals. So they're a little fancier than the standard Israelite uh, member of the flock. But you're looking at a fat-tailed Awasi sheep, which is the standard source 
for wool of all kinds. Their meat and their milk was prized. We have documents going back before the age of writing as to uh, the trade and sacrifice and tribute status that these animals held. The black Sinai goat is the animal standing next to him. Uh, this one is used primarily for milk and meat. They also use the hair, but it's rougher, so it'd be tent curtains and bags and the like. Um, you might ask, why mixed flocks? Why, when you studied Hebrew, is there not a separate word for sheep and goat? It's just sown, a mixed flock. And the answer is a balanced portfolio. 4060. See, those sheep are very, very valuable, but they also tend to die easily. Bummer. Those would be your stocks. Much more value on the market, but if there's any sort of drought or struggle, you're going to lose them. What about that black Sinai sheep? Those things are tough as nails. Like the camel, it has an extremely high tolerance for heat and drought. These guys are your bonds. They can drink 35% of their own body weight in water in a matter of minutes, and they only need to be watered once every four days during times of heat and drought in the hottest part of the year. That's pretty impressive. The other reason that our shepherds keep these mixed flocks is because goats are smart. They are incorrigible. If you've ever owned one, you've seen them on top of your car, uh, but they're smart. Uh, so, whereas a sheep will simply, simply stand there and die a slow, horrible death when attacked by a predator, a goat will run, hello, they will climb, fight back. A herd of sheep literally will water, uh, wander off the side of a wadi into their deaths because the guys, the first three at the front of the pack, did the same. A goat will stand there like the little black goat in one of these images saying, hey guys, don't do that. There's a shortcut over here. We don't have to die today. How does that speak into Jesus' image of the sheep and goats? Well, hmm, just saying. All right, what else do we know about these mixed flocks? Well, they required regular movement between pasturages. A transhuman lifestyle is what uh, we livestock folks call this. They forever kept their shepherds on the move. Because families were also farmers, the flocks were often left with one, maybe two family members isolated out in the hill country in control of 200 or more animals. I can't keep two toddlers in control at the public library, and here you have a 14-year-old in charge of 200 animals. Care for these animals would include defense from predators, birthing assistance on a regular basis, treatment of injuries and disease, seeking and saving the scattered, have you heard that language before, and protecting against those who might try to steal. My friend Tim Laniak, who we'll look at in just a moment, interviewed a Bedouin shepherd who had his entire flock stolen from him three times. He might not be your best future employee. All right. <clears throat> In other words, shepherds of all sorts, chief shepherds and under shepherds were constantly exposed to risk. Regular movement was required. Yes, professor, you will have to rewrite that curriculum at some point in the next 35 years. A lack of manpower often involved ridiculous work hours and extended periods of isolation. Predators were constantly in pursuit of their assets. These images and concepts of shepherding permeate our Bibles. Again, these are the metaphors they lived by, and for the Bedouin living on the margins of urban Israel and Jordan, these are still the metaphors they lived by. It is also important for us to realize that the career of the shepherd was defined by a hostile environment. Take a look at some of these images that Ralph Hawkins, the chair of the Religious Studies Department at Averett University, posted on his Facebook page back in the summer of 2017. He was answering the question from family members, what the heck are you looking for out there? Who could ever survive in that territory? Well, as these images built on his page, can you see behind his sifters, because he's an archaeologist, the rocks in the background? Well, as you get close to the rocks in the background, you realize those rocks aren't rocks. They're actually 
animate creatures. Animate creatures who are passing through the wilderness following their shepherd that they trust. As Brian Fickert and I discussed in our preparation for this conference, uh, keeping your flock alive, keeping your investment safe, required regular movement through terrain such as this from pasture to pasture through the valley of the shadow of death. But this embrace of challenge and change and a shepherd's tireless supervision were simply part of the deal. Now these images I am showing you were completely familiar to our heroes in the Bible. Our problem is that these images are no longer familiar to us in the 21st century. Because of that, when the Bible speaks as shepherd, as a servant leader, we miss the metaphor. We misinterpret the metaphor. We misapply the metaphor. So let's see what we can do to rehabilitate our metaphor. Here is my friend and colleague of many years, Tim Laniac. He works at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He's an expert in leadership studies and also an Old Testament professor. He decided to spend his 2003-2004 sabbatical leave from Gordon-Conwell, um, making sure that he didn't misapply our metaphor. So with a Harvard degree in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, a grant from the Albright Institute, his son Jesse, and and a notebook, he headed into the wilderness of the Bedouin to spend a full year living among these career pastoralists. And oh, what a study he made. So what did Tim learn in his year of interviewing every Bedouin who would talk to him? The first thing he learned is that desert is a dangerous place. Now I want to pause over this for just a moment. Because in my old age, I have learned something, and I want to share that wisdom with you. When I first entered my first job, and I found that there were forces and systems and people who were actually hostile to my success, I was stunned. I'm here building the kingdom of God. My ultimate ambition is to make sure that this institution and its mission succeed. How could it be that there are folks who are actively undermining my survival? I was stunned. I was shocked. I moved into outrage. And in certain parts of my career, I moved into fear. Anyone out there? Why was I stunned and surprised? Because somewhere in my mind, I had assumed that the job situation should be a pleasant, safe, unconflicted place. Well, you know what? The desert is a dangerous place. Tim learned that water is critical and difficult to find, and the responsible shepherd will constantly be on the move, using the, the greatest extent of his ingenuity, his skill, his networking, and his negotiating skills to make sure that his sheep, his goats, have the water they need to survive. He interviewed a set of Bedouin shepherds who spoke of the great drought of the 1950s and 60s. That would be 40 years old at this point in time when he began his interviews, and these shepherds shepherds were still grieving the thousands of animals that they watched die and could do nothing about it. Great leaders of business, sometimes sheep die. He learned an adequate pasturage requires relentless effort, relentless effort in seeking out the places where your investment can thrive, your employees can thrive. He learned that a shepherd is a midwife. In fact, according to these career pastoralists, the lambing season is the crisis of the shepherd's year. This is the true test of their commitment, their stamina, and their skill, because it is a regular event that a you, especially a first-time mother, is going to struggle with the birthing process. Now think about your standard 250-pound tobacco-chewing and spitting armed shepherd kneeling next to a ewe and with gentle hands figuring out how to turn that lamb in the birthing process so the breech birth and presentation doesn't kill or cause his you unnecessary suffering. There is a mixture here in the shepherd as an armed guard 
and a gentle midwife. Strength and gentleness. gentleness. One is not enough. In fact, in the words of Michael Lindsay, who wrote View from the Top, one of the bestseller leadership um, publications, his quote is, show me a leader who is always popular, and I'll show you a mediocre leader. There is no curriculum, according to these Bedouin pastors. Rather, a long-term apprenticeship is required in order to learn the task of leadership and learn the task of the shepherd. Tim tells a story in the midst of this book about a young shepherd named Saeed. Saeed is a very young shepherd. In fact, Saeed is seven years old. Old. By the age of seven, as I read the passage, Saeed, a Bedouin from Sinai, was regularly sent out with a family small flock of 30 goats to feed for the day. One day, Saeed returned at dusk with a goat missing. He apparently had been distracted by a cute little girl shepherd who also had her flock at the foot of the mountain. His father's response was swift and to our minds harsh. Go back out and don't come home without that goat. So the boy seven years old, searched the mountain for two days. Even though the goat, who was smarter than the boy, made its way home by itself the next morning, Saeed's father did not send for his son. So when Saeed returned home, frightened and embarrassed, his father made no apologies. According to the father, this was the traditional way of learning responsibility for the family's flock. Michael Lindsay describes a very similar training plan for the White House Fellowship Elite. You offer a young leader significant work. That means they can screw it up. You offer them a broadening education in the midst of their apprenticeship, and you give them public recognition for both success and failure. Good shepherds aren't born, they are made. Saeed's father's point the life of the flock is, is as important as the shepherd's own. And good shepherds do not lose sheep. So let's turn to one of the most famous shepherds in the biblical text. Ooh, I forgot to do this one. I'm sorry. Um, sheep themselves are indeed completely defenseless. These are, Our sheep do not have teeth. They do not have claws. They are not aggressive. Their only response to the threat of a predator is to huddle. That's it. They huddle. Have you ever been a part of a committee meeting? Have you ever been a part of a failing business? Have you ever been a part of an unpopular board of trustees or perhaps a faculty meeting? The only defense that sheep have is to huddle, and as I think I've mentioned before, they are not smart. On top of that, sheep regularly get lost and panic. And you know what a sheep does when it panics? It finds a bush, it tries to hide next to it, and it starts crying, (laughs) bleeding. Now, if you want a surefire way to find a wolf in the wilderness, isolate yourself, and then start making noise. Yes. All right, he also learned that shepherds do indeed call their sheep by name, and the sheep come. In fact, shepherds will often share pasturage, and five flocks will come together. The shepherds will eat lunch together, um, shoot the breeze, uh, share whatever alcohol is in their pack, and then at the end of the day, everybody heads off to one corner of the area and starts calling their sheep, Fluffy, Fluffy number two, Fluffy with the yellow stain, Fluffy with the black mark, and Fluffy comes, which speaks of a relationship between shepherd and sheep that actually reminds me of that documentary that we saw last night, The Miracle at Pitron. Sheep who trust their shepherd and will answer his call. What else did he learn is that one lost sheep is a tragedy, tragedy, and that must be corrected, which of course is the story of Saeed at Sinai. All right, so let us move forward. And as we move forward to 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is the story of one of the most famous shepherds in the biblical narrative, David. And as we read, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pastor. 
from following the sheep to be the ruler of my people Israel. This passage comes from David's covenant of royal grant, that contract in which his patron, Yahweh, invested in his career by hiring him for a strategic position of leadership. And the metaphor for effective leadership is shepherd. David has proven himself in one context, a smaller context with less responsibility, and he's being hired up to a much larger and more significant context. The second text is the same leader, 2 Samuel chapter 12, where our same leader has now succumbed to the temptations of money, sex, and power, who has compromised his personal integrity and those who work for him by involving them in his own personal Watergate scandal and the cover-up to follow. And one member of his administration, an insider, actually has the courage to confront him. In the words of Albus Dumbledore, it takes great courage to confront your enemies. It takes more courage to confront your friends. And Nathan actually confronts his friends, and he stands in the midst of a royal courtroom with enlisted men lining the walls, armed to the nines, without a weapon at his own side, and he confronts the king. And he exposes him in front of his own people. And when he exposes him, as you know so well, David could have had him killed where he stood. And instead, this shepherd bows his knee because he is confronted with a shepherding parable and he remembers his own integrity and he is inspired to repentance and to reform. You know the story. Now, interesting, David not knowing that Nathan was speaking a parable, actually probably assumed this was a regular court case. And he, as the chief court of the land, was supposed to adjudicate it. He adjudicates it according to his first loyalties. That man will die, and he will repay fourfold, which is way over the top for Israelite law. But David speaks from his heart, and his insider, with very little empathy, for David's crime, stands in front of that board of trustees and says, you are the man. The last one is Psalm 78. When David, who has been selected, trained, rebuked, and paid the price for his crime, we read of how David is ultimately now, having been seasoned and recovered from his mistakes, characterized as a caring and skillful shepherd. I won't read the passage to you, but let me tell you that according to Psalm 78, good shepherds use their authority to nurture and defend, to lead out of danger and into success. They see their position as a calling, not just a stepping stone. They see the individual, not just the institution, and they stand their ground against predators. That's what good shepherds do. As I watch the clock ticking away, let's see how far I can get in this study. You are looking at my handy-dandy timeline of the biblical story. You, too, can own one if you decide to order a seedbed product. Um, we start with David and the United Monarchy, who becomes our paradigmatic king. Every king who ruled in his wake was compared for good or for ill to David. He was the template. His dedication to the flock was the bar to which others were held. And as you know so well, most of those who followed failed. And so we move into the divided monarchy. And with the divided monarchy, we watch the north crash and burn. And then we watch the south crash and burn. Now, there were a few moments of brightness in this midst. We've got our Hezekiahs. We've got our Josiahs. But what we learn is that most of the shepherds of Israel were more concerned with their own success, hear me, more concerned with their own comfort, their own popularity, their own network, their own notoriety, their own publications and careers, than they were with the kingdoms that God had entrusted to them. We will see repeatedly that the kingdom most of these leaders were building was not God's kingdom. 
They were building their own kingdom. And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart this morning. And so when the death after decades of second chances, silenced prophets, and broken promises, at last the axe fell, these are the words that Yahweh had for his leaders. He states, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the shattered. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. What kind of shepherd are you? You are not the shepherd that I've designed. No, my people have been scattered because there was no shepherd. When they were scattered, they became prey for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains and over every high hill, and they became prey. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one went out after them to search for them. If you know your biblical history really well, you know that what Ezekiel is speaking of as the scattering is the exile in 586 BC, the great watershed of Israelite history, that horrific moment in time when the curses of the covenant of Sinai came home to roost. Israel is stripped of their land. They are stripped of their homes, their flocks, their children, their lives. Because of the unending, uncorrected rebellion of Israel, God finally says, enough. And when he says enough, he places all this heart-wrenching loss on the shoulders of his shepherds. You did not keep my flock. You thought it was your flock. Whose kingdom are you building? And who does this flock belong to? As we step into the New Testament and start closing this one down, Greg, I promise, we see that Jesus corrects this error. Jesus steps into the New Testament, and Luke makes this statement. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. The lost what? You know the metaphor now. He's talking about sheep. Matthew repeats the image. When he saw the crowds, he was moved deeply because they were harassed and disheartened like sheep not having a shepherd. And then Jesus commands his disciples, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who were the lost sheep of Israel? In the first century, those would be the Jews who had gotten lost in the conquest of the Roman Empire, who have lost a sense of connection to their heritage. They have forgotten who they are. Perhaps, if we were to speak this metaphor into your business setting, it would be that part of your constituency that has gotten lost when the company merged with another entity whose sense of connection to the mission and identity of your organization has become blurred and confused, who no longer sees themselves as important to the mission of the calling of your organization. So Jesus corrects the failed leadership of Ezekiel's critique with his own example and thereby rehabilitates not only the image of shepherd, but the image of David as well. Indeed, Jesus makes the statement I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Good shepherds don't lose sheep. This is the shepherd who calls his sheep by name, and they know his voice. That's who I am. That's what I do. And of course, that is what my under shepherds are supposed to do as well. And then Jesus warns his followers that on the night that he dies, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Clearly, Jesus is still capitalizing on this ancient image of leadership and he is continuing to portray the people of God as sheep in need of a shepherd. Let's step to the final passage here. Jesus has died, he has risen, and he has one final exchange with his disciples. Whereas the Gospel of Matthew ends with the Great Commission, to the twelve, go out and save the lost, the Gospel of John ends with another Great Commission given only to Peter. You know Peter. He is arguably Jesus' best friend. He's his closest disciple, his fiercest supporter. But as we all know, when push comes to shove, Peter runs 
and he denies his master, his mentor, and his friend. And we all know the emotions that are racing through Peter's heart, churning in that man's soul as he looked across the breakfast fire into the eyes of the one he truly loved. So when they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus spoke to Simon Peter, and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Jesus said to Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because Jesus had asked him a third time. And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. And he's being asked three times if he's loyal. Three times Peter says, yes, yes. And Jesus says, if you love me, take care of my sheep. Yeah. Folks, I don't care if your flock is a two-man staff in the physical plant, or if your flock is 18 students in a beginning Greek class. I don't care if your flock is three bright-eyed, irascible elementary-age children who are sucking the life out of you, <laughs> or if your flock is an organization with an international constituency and thousands of employees who call you boss. The same principles apply. This is the task to be done. There are people who depend on you, and there is someone you answer to. How are you going to keep his flock? And so we return to the image, the image of the good shepherd. Bad shepherds, we have learned, use their authority to promote themselves at the cost of those under their care. Bad shepherds don't recognize the cost their employees are paying for their success. Bad shepherds distance themselves from good employees when there is a political risk. Bad shepherds fail to exercise courageous leadership when correction is required. Bad shepherds write off the loss of a few good men to the vagaries of business. Good shepherds stand sleepless, farsighted, weather-beaten, armed, leaning on his staff, looking out over his scattered sheep, every one on his heart. That is a good shepherd. The last passage of our biblical text speaks about how never again will God's flock hunger or thirst, never again will the sun beat on them for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. The most vulnerable of the flock is being elevated to the task of shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and he will wipe their tears from their eyes. So the final word here in my minutes way over, Greg will forgive me, I hope, is that shepherds, here's the good word for those of you who are feeling burdened, shepherds are also sheep. And we can't leave this presentation without these words. As you feel the burden of the leadership that has been entrusted to you, know that you too are a sheep. And you are under the care and the careful, sleepless defense of the Almighty. The Lord is my shepherd. These words were penned by David the most burdened under shepherd of all biblical history. The Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing. I will allow this to continue to stand as I say to you as a benediction, guys, the ultimate peace is knowing that God is on our side, that he indeed calls each of us to stand in the gap, but he also speaks to us to rest to rest in our submission to his care. The rest of knowing that ultimately the buck does not stop on my desk. Yeah, my desk is heavy and there's a lot on it, but the buck all ultimately stops with the great shepherd. And so a benediction for you, O oh faithful shepherds and sheep. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Be at peace. Wow. Wow, that's quite an awesome presentation and certainly giving us insight on what we need to do as shepherds and being cared for by the great shepherd and bishop of our souls. I'd like to bring uh, before you um, and take this a little further, and we're going to call uh, Brian Fickert and Delano Sheffield. I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first, Brian Fickert is the founding president of the Chalmers Center and a professor of economics and community development at Covenant College. Among other works, he is co-founder of the classic book, When Helping Hurts, and recently co-authored Practicing the King's Economy. We're glad to have Brian with us. Delano Sheffield is the discipleship pastor at the Macedonia Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. And he's an adjunct professor at the Carver Baptist College. He's also in the Institute and Theological Seminary. Prior to obtaining his Master's of Divinity degree, he entered the pastoral ministry and he received his Bachelor of Science degree in an architectural engineering and he's worked for Blue Scope Construction, formerly Butler Manufacturing for the past 17 years. First, we'd like to bring Brian Fickert and then following him will be Delano Sheffield. God bless you, Brian. Some sheep are bigger than others. I'd like to ask you to consider two questions this morning. The first one is this. What does success look like for you in the marketplace? What does success look like for you in the marketplace? Really think of your answer. And number two, how can you achieve such success? How can you achieve such success? Speaking of sheep, in many ways, the global marketplace feels like green pastures. It's a place where we can express our image bearing, where we can specialize in our giftedness and exchange with others. And indeed, the global marketplace has led to unprecedented human uh, economic flourishing in some sense. And as globalization spreads markets across the world, we're seeing unprecedented reductions in global poverty. I like markets. I'm an economist. I like incentives. I like the signals of the marketplace. I like economic growth. Growth is kind of a specialty of mine. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> but there are some wolves lurking in the marketplace as well. Let me try to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a, a, a graph uh, I've been taught as an economist. If you can't put it into a graph, it doesn't matter. On the horizontal axis, we have time. On the vertical axis, we have the self-reported happiness of uh, people. On the left side, an income per capita. On the right, I want to show you something. This is for the United States. The blue line shows what's happened to real income per capita in the United States. And as you can see, it's gone steadily up from 1972 to the present. And the red line shows the self-reported happiness of the average American. And what you can see there is that while we've experienced unprecedented economic growth, our self-reported happiness is not increasing. Now, folks, if you're an economist, this one picture is like saying the resurrection didn't happen. We cannot conceive of a world in which income goes up steadily and happiness does not. If we look at more recent eras, we actually see that the self-reported happiness of Americans is actually declining. From 2006 to the present, we see a steady downward trend in the self-reported happiness of Americans. If you look at more objective measures than self-reported happiness, things like mental illness, we actually see a long-term, very disturbing trend that, that during uh, 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 the last decades of American history, from 1930 to the present, periods of unprecedented economic growth, we see increasing increases in mental illness in America, particularly amongst America's youth. 
And there's a growing number of social scientists, including some economists, who actually are starting to believe that this is not um, just perchance, but that there are actually things in the global marketplace. There are actually features of the marketplace that are contributing to both unprecedented economic growth and to increases in mental illness. And this raises questions along the following lines. What really is economic flourishing? What does it really look like? Perhaps we've missed something. And number two, what does it mean more fundamentally to actually be a human being? What is a human being and where does economic flourishing come from? Well, the scriptures give us some insights into this. The, the human being is not just a body. We are bodies and souls. And our souls can be divided, or, or uh, I shouldn't have said divided. Our souls can be thought of as having different facets to them. They have minds, affections, and wills. And those souls are highly integrated with our bodies. They're not separate. They're highly integrated. And furthermore, we are wired for something. We are wired for relationship. We are wired to use our integrated bodies and souls to live in proper relationship with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. I like to visualize this as a wheel. And there's several reasons for this. One is a wheel is interconnected. If any part is out of whack, the whole wheel collapses in on itself. To be a functioning wheel, you have to be balanced. The second reason I like the image of a wheel is because a wheel both has structure to it, and yet it also can be changed and altered. The shape of a wheel is altered by the nature of the road on which it's traveling. If a wheel goes over a pothole, it will actually be warped and, and, and disturbed and distorted. And so a wheel has both structure to it, but it can also be shaped. And how is the wheel shaped? Well, human beings, this, this mind, affections, will, body, relational kind of creature, human beings are created and called to use that personhood to be image bearers. To be an image bearer is to be a mirror. We reflect whatever we are worshiping. There's some biblical truths here. Very quickly, I want to draw our attention to. The first is this. Human beings are always worshiping something. We are made for worship. We can't help but worship. Number two, human, human beings are transformed into the image of whatever God they're worshiping. We are malleable creatures. We can be reshaped, and we are actually reshaped into the image of whatever God we are worshiping. Three, we then create culture in that image. We create culture in our image, which is the image of the God we are worshiping. And so worship is at the heart of how the human being is transformed and shaped. And theologians and philosophers have given us some indication of what this process of reshaping looks like. Very quickly, communities are, are directed by their story of change, their notion of what the good life is, of what success is, and of how that success can be achieved. And as individuals in that community pursue that story of change, they engage in formative practices. They engage in practices that are oriented towards achieving the goal, and those practices actually shape them because we're malleable creatures. And over time, those, those stories of change and those practices get solidified in systems, in institutions, both formal and informal, that perpetuate those stories over time and reinforce them. And then finally, that shapes our personhoods. We become shaped by the communities, their stories of change, their practices, and their systems. And here's the point I need you to get. The community of the global marketplace is worshiping a false god. The community of the global marketplace is worshiping a false god. I'm an economist. Mainstream economics in the West, also called neoclassical economics, which forms the basis of the global economy, uh, has some things going on in it that are not uh, for human flourishing. And globalization is spreading this community to the world. Very quickly, if I can advance my slides, there we go. Mainstream economics teaches that there are simply some things that are incontrovertibly true that we can all agree upon, whether we are Muslims, Hindus, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Chinese, Africans, Caucasians, whatever. We can all agree on some basic facts, says my discipline. This is in the first chapter of every textbook in the world. And here are some of the basic facts of my discipline. Number one, human beings are homo economicus. 
We are autonomous, rational, self-interested material creatures. And number two, the goal of the marketplace is to serve homo economicus. This is the unquestioned fact or presupposition of my field. And that has become embedded in the shaping narratives of the global marketplace. The goal is to serve homo economicus. And the way of serving homo economicus, the self-interested, rational, material creature, is through unmitigated growth achieved through capital accumulation and technological change. The formative practices of the global marketplace reinforce this. We go to work in corporations centered on serving self-interested homo economicus. We go home at night and watch television and turn on the radio and the mass media is telling us it's all about you. It's all about serving your material self-interests. And this has become embedded in the systems of the global marketplace. The World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, multinational corporations, the media reinforce this message. And it's shaping our individual personhoods. In fact, I would suggest to you that what is happening in the global marketplace is a deformation of this image bearer, this mind, affections, will, body, relational creature into homo economicus, a self-interested, materialistic, isolated individual. We are not meant for this. This is not what human flourishing looks like, and our bodies and our personhoods are screaming out against this as evidenced by the increases in mental illness in society. The goal of the story of change of the kingdom of God is different from the goal of the global marketplace. People experience human flourishing when we serve as priest kings, using our entire personhoods to enjoy loving relationships with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. And the way to achieve this goal is through the gift of the Son and the Spirit, the triune God who accomplishes this reconciliation of ourselves with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. And so, folks, what I would suggest to you today is that as we go into the global marketplace, we need to go with a different story of change, a different set of practices, a different set of systems than those being served up to us by the global marketplace. And quite frankly, we don't all know what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like. We're going to have to experiment. We're going to have to create new models. And so my message to you is, yes, the marketplace is a place that is under the lordship of Jesus Christ, but we've got to understand that it looks di- the, king- the economy of the kingdom of God looks different from the economy of this world. We've got to come up with new models and new ways of living out his story in that marketplace. And what we need is economic discipleship. What we need is economic discipleship for our flocks because there are wolves lurking in the marketplace. And so shameless commercial. (laughs) Practicing the King's Economy is a book primarily co-authored by two friends of mine that tries to uh, engage with this different narrative of the economics of the kingdom of God and asks how can we practice the good news of King Jesus' economy in the global marketplace. And finally, another book coming out soon called Becoming Whole, Why the Opposite of Poverty Isn't the American Dream. Please join me and others in improvising the story of King Jesus' economy. Some sheep are just right. There's a danger that we all face as we head to work each day. A villain that seeks to take us out on any given Monday or Sunday if you work weekends. You may fall victim to it and not even realize it, even though you're working hard. We call it the monotony of repetition. Repetition may make you look productive in your work task, but it may not be fruitful in hearing the voice of God. Let me give you an example. It's 5.30 a.m. You push the snooze button 17 times until it's 7.15. Then you wake up frustrated trying to accomplish in 15 minutes what normally takes you over an hour. And you head into work into your daily task, frustrated because you've already been lulled into the monotony of repetition because the morning ritual you performed today is the same thing you did yesterday. 
Vain repetition can keep us from hearing the questions that God asks us repeatedly throughout the day, like, why are you working if in the kingdom there's always enough? And while you're stressing about your daily calendar, he's asking you, is this the day that I've made? We may miss his questions, but they're always there, weaving through every cubicle and storage aisle. Yet there are very few Monday mornings in the office, far few evenings, Friday evenings, refing football games, and even less days in the factory where we hear the question, what if you're the shepherd? If God is using us, what if you're the shepherd? I believe the marketplace and the workers who are there matter. And when we get beyond pay grades and promotions as our primary success, we find three results of what happens when we're working as shepherds. One, we recognize the people around us. Two, we reconcile them and the work towards wholeness. Three, we learn to remain. I had a lighting professor during my days as an engineer, and he closed the door on our windowless classrooms and turned the lights off and began to lecture. And I wasn't sure if I should take notes, so I just scribbled in the dark. He talked of lighting history and the current trends in lighting, and then he went into lighting theory, and he explained that just a small crack under the door would be enough light that eventually over time, you couldn't make out color, but you'd be able to make out a lot of the shapes in the room. And sure enough, he was right. The gospel is light in the world, and as shepherds, we can't miss the things that God is showing us. Linwood Fellows is our whole life discipling arm at our church where we help those people in the marketplace ask good questions about God's presence in their workplace. It's one thing to read good research and to ponder its metrics, but to see people to go beyond their mass to their persona, we have to be present. So we've decided to take jobs in the service industry in order to learn or to remember for some of us how to do good work well there, restaurants and catering. At some point, I'm hoping to get on at Walmart too. So the last few months, I took a job as a dishwasher at a local restaurant in Kansas City called IHOP. My approach to that job was different because I recognized my, pers my, pers my presence for being there. Jay, uh, let's call him, his name's Jay, a 17-year-old kid was my trainer. And while I may look like I'm 20, I'm not. And after a few shifts, I didn't feel like I was 20 either. Jay walked me through the process of washing dishes, of doing food prep, of mopping the kitchen, of mopping the freezer, which was not warm, mopping the bathrooms, which were not clean. And I could have decided he's just a 17-year-old kid and this is just dishwashing, but I would have missed Jay's face. I would have missed his great ideas about improving the dishwashing process or what was missing from management or his plans after graduating. I would have only known to open and shut the dishwasher two times for plates, three times for silverware. In our post-industrial global market where repetition is productivity and the vast majority of goods and, and services we enjoy are from people that we don't really know, we have to learn to see the people that we work with daily. We shepherd to know their persona, their hopes and their dreams, their desires, their idiosyncrasies, their frustrations and how they create well. We shepherd their questions about self-interest versus motivation, about power versus corruption, about compassion and justice. When we, shep when we recognize people, we can reconcile them and the work towards wholeness. Our Linwood fellows are reminded what pastors tend to forget from time to time to tell us is that you are in full-time ministry. And as God's representatives, we work in anticipation of reconciliation and redemption of all things, seeking a wholeness not simply for ourselves, but for those and the people that we work with. We learn to be with people and with the work that we do. We shepherd with integrity and intimacy. One of our business fellows is a senior leader for an investment company. So I asked him, how do you shepherd the large number of people you lead? And he gave a story of an example that probably never happens for you all, a person who's contributing negatively to the group, but taking credit for the good things that occur. This led him to learn that shepherding doesn't mean that you will be liked by everyone or that they'll even want to follow but you still have to serve the people and the work. I remember my days in high school playing in a concert band, Tom Hauser's Pilgrim's Chorus, the melodic sounds and crescendos placed intricately in every measure, as good as a high school band could do. I'd often though get caught up in the music and I would stop playing only to get to the end of the song and hear the composer say, incomplete. And I think, incomplete, why is that? We didn't have any oboes. It doesn't matter how good the work sounds in terms of production. It may be work beautifully done, but if we leave people out, if we don't see their faces, it's incomplete. 
This means that the person of the humble means has a right at the table. It means that women have a right to speak into the work. It means that the dishwasher's perspective is just as intricately valuable as the manager or the owner. This is the, this is the recipe for wholeness. Not that we'll see it today, but we know that in the kingdom there are no mundane moments. Even the smallest fleeted repeating activity points towards eternity when we wholly know who we belong to. If we're going to shepherd well, we have to recognize the people that we are around. We also have to reconcile them and the work towards wholeness. And lastly, we have to learn how to remain. I'm not advocating that you work overtime. Well, maybe a little. But let me explain. We've learned from our early stages of service work that it is very easy to disengage from our present task and the people that we cross paths with on the pastures of the marketplace. As an engineer, I constantly felt the emptiness, uh, fought against the emptiness of designing buildings I most likely would never get to see. Pastors who make Sunday everything fight against a sense of futility. Our Linwood educators have embraced calling, but to ad nauseum, and they've lost a sense of root. The discipline of remaining teaches us that it is uh, hard to steward well if we're constantly on the go. But the more that we remain with God, we recognize that God is just as present in that project that you hate or that coworker that you, you, you love <laughs> as he is on the best sermon that you've heard on a Sunday morning. Bow in wonder of God's cosmic work hours. He never sleeps nor slumbers. Since the fall in the garden, we find him still at work, remaining, spreading us out, building nations, maintaining creation. When we want to wonder, he brings us back to the things that matter. When we stop creating, he shows us new things and he asks us to join him. When we want to clock out, he says, I'm the same at this morning's huddle, this afternoon's tra uh, training session, and this evening's rush hour. The good shepherd remaining even with you. And now we, have to, and now we belong to Christ and we have to ask, are you just like Christ? In being Christ-like, are you being a shepherd? We have friends and families and passions and, 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 and enjoyment that we go to great lengths to cultivate, to see them become their very best, looking to get the best out of them, to recognize them and to be, see them become whole. We remain with those relationships without fail. We stare into the face of them looking to fully understand them. Why do we shepherd every area of our lives except for work? The good shepherd gives us hands and feet just like him. He recognizes us. He reconciles us to wholeness, and he remains, enduring as an artesian and never rushing to full-time ministry, enduring with 12 flawed co-workers for over three years, enduring on a cross for three hours, enduring in the grave for three days, enduring with you. If we have the hands and feet of Jesus, we have the responsibility to lovingly follow others and the work that we do with the same grace and mercy that follows us all the days of our lives. Thank you. So at this moment, we're going to ask you to gather around your tables just for a few brief moments, and we're going to set up our panel discussion. And please use Slido and make sure that we get those questions in. Right? We'll be right back. I know you're having some great conversations around your table. At this time, I'd like to bring before you David Gill, and he's going to give the tributes to the pioneers of the faith and work movement. I'm sure like you, my mind is so full and my heart is so full, I can hardly wait to get home and share what I've been hearing here. Well, we have two more tributes uh, that we want to make this morning. These are to two amazing shepherds in our uh, Faith at Work movement. The first one is Richard Mao, who is here this morning. And we salute you, Richard Mao, for being a, really a groundbreaking theological scholar, educator, and evangelical leader. Uh, you're a pioneering biblical theologian of culture that encompasses the workplace discipleship of the whole people of God. Rich was educated first at Houghton College and then Western Theological Seminary, earned his MA at the University of Alberta and his PhD at the University of Chicago. He served as professor of Christian philosophy at Calvin for 17 years, then moved to Fuller Seminary in 1985 as professor of Christian philosophy and ethics. 
He served as the dean there and the provost and was made president in 1993 and served 20 years in that role until his retirement in 2013. Rich has nearly 20 substantial books, hundreds of articles and countless public lectures, debates, conversations and interviews might be summarized in three ways. First of all, Rich has given us a robust biblical theology as a solid and inspiring foundation for a philosophy that encompasses and guides all of life from religion and spirituality to politics, economics, and culture to our human relationships to problems of injustice, pain, and loss to work, rest, and play. Few have ever challenged us to think bigger or on a firmer foundation than you have, Rich. Secondly, we have so much to gain, you've taught us, we have so much to gain and so little to lose by truly listening to others. Uh, Rich has been a model of a listening, caring, faithful presence in Protestant Catholic dialogue, in Reformed Anabaptist dialogue, in conversation with Mormons, in learning from fundamentalism, from the natural and social sciences, learning from philosophy, learning in civil conversations with those of very different political or tribal loyalties. It's all about confident faith. It's about common grace, humility, teachability, listening with respect and civility to all those who are created in God's image and likeness. It's about learning. It's about winning the right to be heard. And third, Rich urges not just serious reflection and thinking, but living presence and action in the culture around us. His 2004 book title illustrates the point, Calvinism in the Las Vegas airport, <laughs> making connections in today's world. This means kingdom presence in today's politically chaotic times, in our neighborhoods and cities, in the arts, as well as in the business offices, in the factories. But this philosophy points significantly toward our workplace lives. Rich's 1980 book, called to holy worldliness, developed a theology of whole, whole life discipleship and vocation. All of life lived coram deo, before the Lord, as a remedy to the narrower, narrower perspectives on Christian cultural influence. His subsequent, subsequent scholarly works have mined the Bible and Christian theology to flesh out this vision. In 2000, his book, When Kings Come Marching In, made the case that our cultural work today will have eternal significance in the new earth to come. Greg Forster told me that when he met Rich Mao for the first time, he came away thinking, as a scholar, educator, and public intellectual, that is exactly the kind of person I want to be. A lot of us, Rich, would say exactly the same thing. Richard, we salute you. We thank you for your leadership. We pray that God will bless you and strengthen you for years to come. Let's give him a, our applause. Our other tribute, our final tribute this morning, is to Robert Lavelle. I met, I met him uh, a couple of times back in the 80s in, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh at the Jubilee Conference, and what an honor. But we honor his memory. He died in 2010, a true pioneer business leader who practiced an exemplary faith at work before the phrase was even invented. His father died when Robert was only nine years old. He was born in 1915, so this would be 1924. His father died, and as a teenager during the Depression, Robert had to drop out of high school to work odd jobs to support his family. In 1935, in the midst of the Depression, while working as a restaurant dishwasher, the 20-year-old Robert was offered a job by the owner of the black-owned Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. And that began a 21-year career at the newspaper where he worked in the office, the mail room, and eventually the accounting department. Uh, interrupted by a four-year stint in the US Army in World War II, Robert returned to the Courier and then also earned his BS and MA degrees uh, in business from the University of Pittsburgh in 1951 and 54. Robert started Lavelle Real Estate in 1951, and in 1956, he left the Courier to give it his full-time focus. In 1957, he was made an executive at Dwelling House Savings and Loan, essentially rescuing this bank from near ruin. 
Uh, at that time, his real estate company was seeking a mortgage on a nearby property, but was told the bank could not uh, provide the mortgage because its withdrawals were exceeding its li liquid assets. They were only open a few days of the month, and Robert said, why don't we open the bank full time, and they, why don't you share space with the real estate firm so you can afford to keep it open and staff it all the time. And the bank began to grow uh, slowly at first, but after qualifying to become federally insured in the late 1960s, its assets grew from 130,000 to more than a million in just two years. And all the while, Dwelling House made the mortgage loans that other banks would not. To African Americans with poor credit, to young people just starting out, and it held those loans in-house to maturity rather than selling them. Both his real estate and banking businesses always focused on helping those in the Hill District of Pittsburgh mostly poor black folk. Dwelling House Savings and Loan built up its assets to make loans possible by way of trust and community relationships. Dwelling House held the loans locally so that assets were reinvested in the community. Robert fought against discriminatory banking and real estate systems in order to make loans and housing uh, more accessible, including a groundbreaking 1967 lawsuit that opened up the local real estate multiple listings to African-American realtors. His obituary in the Pittsburgh Courier described him as the man who made buying a home a reality for thousands of Pittsburgh's African-Americans when racism and redlining made loans from traditional banks and mortgage lenders impossible. This is the man who wrote Bible verses on billing statements and who prayed for men who robbed his bank. Mr. Lavelle was a longtime member of Grace Memorial Presbyterian Church where he served as an elder. He taught Sunday school and led a weekly Bible study for nearly 50 years. He was also a member of the board of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and a member of the board of visitors at Pittsburgh's Cotts Business School where there is now a Robert Lavelle Scholarship named in his honor, and I think we may have one of the recipients of the Lavelle Scholarship attending here. So Robert Lavelle uh, in glory, while much of the church was asleep, you were bringing the bright and morning star to your businesses and your community. We are so grateful for your life and witness, and we pray that many will find inspiration in your faithful leadership. Let's salute Robert Lavelle. Thank you, David. In the interest of time, uh, we're only going to be able to have one question, and we'll take the top question and kind of reframe it a little bit. Um, here's what I'd like you to uh, respond to. Um, can you name uh, any wolves that are lurking in your particular economy, field, what you've seen before? What are, the, what are the, some of the wolves that are out there? Is this for me? That's for all of you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, let me just jump in real fast. I, I think um, I think the most important thing for us to recognize as we move into the global economy is that the entire narrative and practices of the discipline that has shaped that global economy claims that there's no wolves at all. And so the introductory chapter of every single economics textbook in the world says the following. There's two kinds of statements in the world, positive statements and normative statements. Positive statements are statements of fact, statements that describe the way things really are. Normative statements are statements about what should be or what ought to be. Economists claim that they only engage in positive statements. Economists claim that the entire field is completely value neutral. The whole thing is absurd. And so, so, so the entire field is based on a premise that there are just facts out there, there's just the way the world works, and that we can all see those facts. And one of those facts is that every human being is homo economicus. And that the normal life is to be homo economicus. It's an unquestioned fact of the discipline. And so what do you think happens to people when every day you go to class and the, and the professor says to you, human beings are self-interested, materialistic creatures. That's just the way it is. If you say that long enough, over and over and over again, people actually get transformed into that thing. 
This is a theological statement, but it's also an empirical statement. There is empirical evidence that students who are exposed to this model over and over again actually become more self-interested. They actually become more materialistic. They actually start to look like homo economicus. And then that plays itself out in all kinds of subtle ways in the way that the global marketplace has been structured. And so the first thing here is just to recognize that there is a great big honking wolf out there, and there is an alternative to this. What happens in the global economy is we've, we've, we've adopted the idea, I'll stop, I promise, that, that, that <laughs> there is no alternative to the global economy. That's like gravity. It just is. It's just out there, and we have no moral choice in it. We have to accept it as a given, and that simply isn't true. We have a moral obligation to create a certain kind of economic place. So the biggest wolf is that we don't recognize that there's a wolf. Right. Anything to add? <laughs> Delaney, you want anything to that? Uh, I just think maybe from a, a practical perspective, it's been five or six years since I've been in the engineering realm, um, that, that self-interest component can make you try to move from place to place. And we have to be careful with those stepping stones because those aren't stones, those are people or that's good work that we're moving from to get to the next thing that we think is gonna make us something that, um, it's not gonna make us any more than what Christ has already made us. So in, in reconciling those kind of perspectives, we have to remember that uh, those people that we work with, um, they matter to God and the work that we're doing matters to God as well. We, we shouldn't forget it because he hasn't. Great, thank you. Anything to add? Andy? I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, if you want to, want to add, uh, ask any more questions, there'll be a Q&A session with these panelists and you certainly can go and attend their workshop in just a few moments after the break and uh, we'll have the workshops ready. Could you give them a hand?